Welcome, everyone. We have Brian, we have Daniel, Rodney, Andrew, Brad, Patrick, and myself, Michael. We've been talking about jails and zones, but we will diversify into Beehive for this call. Uh, uh, Daniel, it sounds like you had a segue into Beehive. Oh, well, I just sort of said it. I, I just, uh, the the uh, the net graph support for Beehive, I think, is as good or better uh, I, I mean, especially with VM Beehive version 1.5, which came out a couple of months ago, I think, um, you just say, you just say that a switch's name, you define the switch's name uh, similarly to the way the netgraph bridge's name is, and you say the type is netgraph, and it will automatically generate and destroy a uh, netgraph socket when creating um, a Beehive VM. And that does clock significantly faster, like significantly faster than um, the Tun Tap and IF bridge. Um, so I think that that would be, I don't, I don't know if there's other reasons why people wouldn't be using NetGraph, but I mean, the performance alone seems to me like a good reason to start, uh, you know, pushing that as the default way we should be, you know, doing Beehive VMs um, for, for our Beehive hypervisors. Do you feel that needs a anyway. tutorial or a video or something to get the word out, or what? For, how do we get that message out? Yeah, I mean, I've been. Yeah, I think I think. Uh, I mean, maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't looked. So I should probably look and see what's out there. And I have been planning to do a, uh, you know. Uh, you know, a journal series a la Dan Langell um, one of these days. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think, I think uh, some demos would be, would be nice. Maybe I could get some of the BSD YouTubers to, to do one also. That would be, I think that would be pretty great because I think, I mean, like why leave 20% performance, you know, sitting, sitting by the sideline for what must be 95 plus percent of Beehive users. Yeah, definitely the information doesn't seem to be out there because at least readily available because I've never even heard of this way of operating and I've been using FreeBSD for 20 years. So that's uh, quite interesting. Actually, more than 20 years, I guess now. Uh, I've always been interested in exploring NetGraph, but didn't find the time to actually get to it. And we're using, uh, of course, uh, IF Bridge for jails and uh, Bridges and and tap for for Beehive, so so that's that. I'm currently uh, googling a bit, and I will put the link into the notes when I find the presentation by Devin that she did two or three years ago, I guess, which was pretty good. That might have been right, that was... Berkeley Meet BSD. I could be wrong. Anyway. Though a lot of that presentation was Devin's own tooling, um, so depending on depending on the setup and, and that that stuff was pretty jail specific. Yeah. So yeah, definitely more more is needed. Now, does uh, this net graph way of uh, you know dealing with networking um, will it work for non FreeBSD guests as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just a, yeah, it, and and with more performance. Yeah, it's just a, yeah, all that's invisible to the, the, um, the guest. The guest just sees whatever driver, you know, E1000 or, or Virtio, Vert, Vert.io. So, um, so it literally replaces bridge and tap and so forth. IF bridge, yeah. Or IF and bridge, tap, yes. Right. Oh, okay. It'll be ng underscore bridge instead. Got it. And you've had no stability issues because the kind of running you almost joke was, oh, it's unstable, but no one's tried it. It's like, oh, yeah. Not yeah. So I mean, it's you're you're sending very precise messages to the the interface. So there's yeah, and there there are things that you there are definitely things that you should know about because the FreeBSD kernel does things magically and automatically for IF bridge that it doesn't do for 
uh, NetGraph bridge, for example, LRO does isn't isn't healthy for some network network cards, like some brands of network cards. Um, if you have LRO enabled in the card uh, on the NIC, um, uh, you can you can definitely have some some performance problems. Uh, so yeah, so so you so there is a checklist of things that you have to know about. So it's not it's not going to work as a drop in replacement for the documentation that's out there for IF Bridge. Well, if that's a short list of of tips and tricks, maybe throw it on the wiki or something, just so it's not lost in the ether. Yeah, it's in my brain and my company documentation right now. Yeah, I'd love to see that list because that would uh, that would be important. Yeah, and then the, the other thing is that you have to set the set your your uh, wired interface. Um, to promiscuous mode. So if you do that wrong or in the wrong order or turn off the wrong feature, you know, bye-bye interface. But I mean, that's true for anything, you know, that can happen if you set an IP wrong too. Um, but yes, that is part of the, part of everybody's NetGraph tips is how to, how to make a bridge. And it's always two commands on the interface um, and then and then uh, then create the bridge and name it. And then the commands are ugly as hell. I, that is, I think, that that everybody would agree with that, right? The, Didn't the you give us NetGraph control? Buddy for that reason? <laughs> well, NetGraph Buddy is, is used by one, one Antrenig and me right now. Oh yeah, okay. and, and only for testing for Antrenig. So yes, but I did I did write a RC RC script that starts before VM starts to uh to do some of that but but that is i guess it is useful in that you can you can look through that code and see what that ng control commands are fired and in what order because if i do it from memory i, I make a mistake that's that's just i, I make a mistake and then is, i'm in a bmc is not graph buddy online is there in github or somewhere yeah and it's probably uh, drop us a link it's if you probably will. reasonably up to date about it yeah sure i got uh yeah, I think I put a copy of it on. It might be it might be slightly outdated, but it does it does charts. It names the it names the VMB Hive interface. If you use VMB Hive, it'll name the interfaces for you and and collect stats for how much uh, you know how much traffic passed through them, and all that stuff's built into NetGraph. It's not you know it's not uh, you know anything I invented. I'm just firing a few ng control commands. And a little bit of awk. Cool. Have I just did a couple of quick Googles and it's the All About NetGraph by Archie Cobb is probably the best introductory document for anybody to read through before they go play down the road of NetGraph. It's it's if we've lost if we're no longer pointing people to this document that's on the project. This is really good stuff. It is in my bookmark, so I guess I am lying somewhat <laughs> that the documentation is not out there. Um, maybe I was just anxious because it looked... Uh, it's it out there, but the, nobody's, pointing, nobody's pointing at it anymore. And that's exactly why they think, oh, it's old. But this is the fundamental underlying concepts and none of this that has changed. This is how NetGraph works and, and how you use it. Uh, oh, would that, oh, all about NetGraph and introduction to NetGraph. <laughs> One on NetBSD, hello. Um, I'm having a little trouble finding that. Um, Is this the Damon News article, Rodney? That's what shows up. I believe me. the pointer to the Damon News article is a dead link. You will it will point there, but I don't think there's any content. Well, I see content um, in Damon News, which is a scary thought because that site might that runs the risk of disappearing. Are you sure that it's it's not? You're reading a Damon News two two thousand 
three article all about netgraph that's actually hosted by people.freebsd.org tilda julian mm, oh it redirected there we go nope yep <laughs> it Great. didn't read so it didn't it didn't redirect the search results point to uh, as what i'm saying is the damon news article disappeared a long time ago okay but he's got it with all the framing of damon news on his julian page uh what is the canonical source uh, this one uh what is the can canonical source of that, Rodney? Are I you... would say the best canonical source is the copy in Julian's directory. Oh, fine. I'll go with it. Julian, sure. Julian Ar and Archie Cobb are the authors of, of NetGraph while they worked at Whistle Communications. More Archie than Julian, but they both worked on it. Cool. ARC. It was it was originally designed to move almost the complete network stack as far as the layer two stuff into user land. Well, it, or into separate code, not really user land. I believe the whistle ran this in user land. Thank you for the link to NetGraph Buddy. Daniel, thank you for that link, Rodney. And is it safe to say that NetGraph is pretty much jail and beehive agnostic? It has benefits to both. That's the cool thing is it, yeah. it's, I find it to be extremely easy to, to have happy little uh, virtual, virtual networks and of course real networks where jails and beehive coexist happily. Cool, so we're out of excuses. <laughs> Other discussion on NetGraph? Ooh, I see a code sample, what you got? As ah, an example, Andrew, that, is a, that is what a zone config would look like for a machine that's got a VLAN on it attached to an external NIC. Does any of that need to be sanitized? No, it looks like pretty. No, local. I san I sanitized Thank it Great. already. Thank you. That's pretty cute. That's yeah. really clear. There's no Netgraph is not. I mean, ePair isn't either. ePair is, you know, a, a few commands for yeah. I I can't get my ePairs. E you can change that to tank if you want thing. or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. Tank is a canonical, I'm sure. I think cool. that's what they always use. I didn't change that, but yeah, it, it it's got the the type of zone it is, how it boots, and then <clears throat> what the permitted addresses are. Now there are other things that it will fill in automatically, like the um, I think the MAC address for it will be automatically filled in. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is, in this case that's listed here, IGB three is a actual physical NIC. You can replace that with an aggregate, but the aggregate you have to make externally. That's like one other command. Right. Right. Cool. Thank you, Brad. What's on your mind? I don't know if you've been to many of these. Maybe you're due for an introduction. Yep, this is uh, this is the first one I've listened in on, and <clears throat> I would definitely call myself a a, a novice. Um, uh, Are you using free... Beehive? Uh, yeah, I've been using FreeBSD for probably about six or seven years now, and uh, in the last uh, six months, picked up Beehive as a replacement for Proxmox for myself. Um, so you know, learning learning the differences between the two and uh, what makes one better and easier to run. <clears throat> uh, what motivated person. that migration? Um, getting it to, uh, I, I've been using FreeBSD for a file server for myself for quite a few years, like I said, and uh, I was using Proxmox and it, it did an update and then failed to turn on one day. And it was okay. Well, 
now's good as time as any to to try this new thing I keep hearing about. So um, moved over and yeah, it's it it works well. Um, having some issues with uh, 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 networking when I try to attach set up multiple switches on it's one nick that's already got the vlans created on the host um i have having some issues where the networking keeps dropping every minute or so um, yeah. can you describe the topology a little more uh so uh by network um it's it's a melanox x3 card it's got two nicks on it one of them is for the host for uh, all of its communication and it's got several it's got three vlans set up and then this other port on the NIC, uh, i've got the same three vlans set up on a different host ip address and then just using the uh, uh the vlan switches in vnb hive and uh, so it's it's you know create switch public one is you know mlx one dot whatever the vlan is same for two same for three and whenever i set it up that way then i'm I'm having issues where it's dropping out every two or three minutes it's it's resetting the networking adapter <clears throat> but then if i just take it back to just one switch one vlan that's it then it doesn't do that so that's why I, yeah hearing you guys talk about netcraft that sounds very very interesting sounds like uh, you gave me Gave me a full weekend of stuff to play with. Is it possible that you're creating a switch loop that spanning tree protocol is then killing ports down? Uh, that's that's very, very possible. <clears throat> How would he diagnose that or watch for? What would he watch for? Um, well, first off, kind of draw your topology to see if you've made a loop somewhere in it. Um, or understand that you can't have a loop in a, a topology that's not going to, the loop's going to get broken somewhere if, if spanning tree is running. And if you're not running spanning tree, you're going to kill yourself with, with a packet flood as soon as somebody sends a broadcast. Um, as far as diagnosing that problem is generally you, um, you have to look to see if a port has been put in non-forwarding mode by STP, and I'm not sure how to see that in vSwitch, in, in our switch. Somebody else here in the group may know how to get the STP state of a port. I, I can check, I think. Um, this is a frequent problem in the um, TrueNAS forum because uh, it says again, sorry, but uh, the automatic creation of bridges in TrueNAS frequently creates loops if uh, people have manually created expert bridges, VLANs, complex topologies, or stuff like that. So um, the problem is not that FreeBSD does not support spanning tree, but that the default for a bridge port is off. So you have to explicitly enable spanning tree and all will be good. I have seen that default and it scares me. <laughs> Any, anyone who hasn't brought down an entire data center thriller first, so yeah. <laughs> been there. The question is, why is this the default for IF Bridge? Not to enable spanning tree for all I have no idea that are added as a member. Maybe we should raise a to get with FreeBSD and kindly just ask for change of the default? Probably much as the default is local unbound to forward RFC 1918 address space requests. Technically in violation of one RFC, maybe two, but the default nonetheless, because that's convenient for the users. I don't know that having STP off is convenient for the users, though. I really... It's not a significant amount of traffic. It's a safety thing. But yeah, I would all be all behind raising a, why are we doing this and should we change it type PR. 
this is probably just the kind of thing that it's got written, it's been that way, and no one's asked. Well, it's probably because everybody's going to say, oh, well, the use case of it is, is between the NIC and, and jails and VMs, and there's no way, you know, you, you don't create loops like that. I'm like, no, people are using bridge in more than that way. And obviously, they're foot shooting. Yeah. Of, of, of course, people are using bridge to create a cheap switch out of a four-port appliance for OpenSense and stuff like that. If I have a four-port device, why shouldn't I use three ports for LAN and, and one for uh, uplink? And with, rework, and with reworking of, of IF Bridge by Christoph, even the performance is perfectly okay. Yeah, I'm interested. Somebody said 20% faster with NetGraph. I'm kind of, mm, why is that? Because I thought that the bridge in kernel had been the performance issue with it had been fixed. Yes, but the tap is still single queue as I understand it. And that's now your ah. new bottleneck. <laughs> Different bottleneck. Well, so Brad, there goes your weekend experimenting with yeah. that. And Brian, hopefully, yeah, you can get OpenBSD under NetGraph under most likely VM Beehive. Let's, you know, I'm impressed you've used the tools you've used for so long. Uh, so a small point of order. I just got the video up for the jail call. Enjoy. It's a mere two and a half hours. Um, Patrick, do you have anything new to share? Just a little bit of gossip. I finally managed to raise a bit of awareness of the bridge networking mess and trueness with uh, Morgan and uh, uh, Chris, Chris Moore. Mm -hmm. And uh, they essentially stated that IOKH is abandonware. I'm not sure right now what this means for uh, trueness core. And, and jails in general. But they would be willing to first update the documentation, which means work for me, but I think I'm, I'm going to help here. So we'll update the documentation to raise awareness for the users that they need to do a manual bridge setup if they want to use jails or VMs with TrueNAS. And uh, then possibly in a second step, remove the automatic creation of bridges from, from TrueNAS because that's just a mess. So you can try to do the right thing, but it will override you and create a mess? Um, it's a bit intransparent. TrueNAS, if you can create a VM in TrueNAS and connect it to an interface in the UI, and then it will auto-create a bridge. Okay. Now, if this, if this interface is already part of a different bridge for various reasons, because you're messing around with VLANs and you have a, a system with, say, four or five Ethernet interfaces and you want to get your free switch, see above for open sense, then all of a sudden, by the automatic creation of another bridge, you will have a loop and uh, your network will go down which is, is not a good thing. And, and and people on the forum ask for help because they cannot get jail and VM network to work. And they are not aware that they are even running bridges. Ah. So my stance in the forum, and I have explaining this over the last years again and again and again, uh, see our discussions in, in this group, when I documented a bit what in our data center or bridging setup looks like with uh, LACP and bridges and VLANs and everything working really great. So I've been explaining this again and again and again, and I've raised tickets in the JIRA of IX systems, and which have been ignored or engineering closed. So finally, I, I wrote a direct message to, to Morgan and said, this is a mess and this needs to be fixed. So excuse me for being bluntly German here, and uh, he said, yes, it is, but we are not going to put much resources in it, but we could start with the documentation and then possibly disable defaults that are dangerous. 
Do you have a canonical forum thread on that that at least has some of the answers? I see Monday I can, at 12, I can, dig, I can dig out one of the, the dozen threads where I uh, where I explained how it's supposed to work to, to some user. No, oh, the I'm link just, I just dropped in, maybe that's yeah. it. It's pretty fresh. <laughs> OK. But yeah, if you have a better one, please. Yes, of course. Cool. So now, now they at least know that they have a problem there. Ah, uh, that that's not much much context. I just okay. tell the 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 user the correct incantations for IO cage, and that's that. I have okay. I have longer threads where I explain things from the ground up. Oh uh, yeah, I, if you can find that, problem. fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, while looking for that, and I suspect Corbin might join on the hour given the time change difference, but his uh, FW config patches have landed last week. They didn't make it into the snapshot, but it's super easy to check out a fresh source tree, jump into user bin beehive, do a make, make install, and you get the new functionality, which he does say is somewhat limited, but it's plumbing for the future. So you it will default to the classic uh, UEFI firmware by default, but you can now use the FW CFG equals either QMU or I believe Beehive to select the type of uh, firmware handling. That's a bit inside baseball, but congratulations Con Corvin for getting that in. And if anyone wants to do a remote or read a blog post or something else presentation for BeehiveCon, just reach out to me. I'm happy to read through, if, if it comes to that, a forum post from Patrick, just explaining that because all types of content are fair game. These calls have proven that just opening up for discussion can be very effective. So that's all. Any topics for the coming year, especially folks like Daniel? Michael, sorry, I, I, yes, uh, please. I forgot to unmute. Uh, will the conference be in a hybrid format? Well, uh, possibly, depending on the content. I have some open BSD developers, Dave DV at and Mike Larkin have stepped forward with interest. And I know two people from UPB will be there. And uh, I, so... I'm I'm not going to make it. I would be willing to present a bit of the the networking and, and bridge topic, but um, it would have to be remote. Oh, no problem at all. And I'm, I'm open what, to remote. I'm, I'm happy to like reading your own materials if need be, whatever uh, it comes down to, or can a video, whatever works. I'm flexible. I, I was a bit disappointed that, for example, BSD can was strictly uh, in presence. <sighs> Did they? Express that as a policy, because I know, for example, in Vienna, yes, they, yes, had so they did in the, in, the, in the call for papers. They expressly ah. said that mm -hmm. uh, speakers are supposed to be uh, at the location. Understood. And did you find that link? Well, still browsing through. Two or three decades worth that, of forum that posts. look that look promising. Speaking of BSD can, uh, I have not advocated for a beehive con because there it's a little more complicated. A room needs to be reserved and rented, whereas in Tokyo they're like. Huh, go over there, no problem. Um, how many present here hope to be at BSD CAN, if any? I still haven't asked about it yet. I'm okay. bad. That's <laughs> not so bad. And 
Daniel, your script isn't, what's the word you use? Dumb. It's not dumb. Come on. It does the job and makes it easier. So let's not put ourselves down. How many people here are using FRR? None. Okay. Daniel, not using it? Free range routing? No. Should I? Uh, Rod, I believe we need a quick crash course on its abilities <laughs> as, I believe, a routing daemon. <laughs> No, I mean, it's just people are going to use different software. I just wanted to find out if we have a bunch of FRR users in this community. It would be an excuse for me to go to BSD CAN. Ah. Uh. Let me rephrase that. Are people running any routing virtual machines? And if so, what are they using? That sounds Aaron like probably a IPs, no. So, yeah, Aaron won't give me any IPs. So, but I, I do deserve them. I, I deserve, I deserve lots of them, and I've asked, and I've given them money, and they said no. Really? V six. Well, V six, they'll give me. <laughs> I, I should, I should actually, I should actually, you know. I should actually do lots of V6. That's right. How much V4 do and you need? That's the thing. I probably, I, it's probably hard to justify because I'm building, I, I run an MST. So I'm only hosting for my, for my clients and the data centers hand me IPs. But I want to do hosting on a much larger scale. So I've been, you know, growing outward to 25 or so hosts now. And it would be really, really nice if I wasn't only relying on DNS for failover. So uh, I'm getting to the point where I can I can justify it. I just can't justify it yet. So that's what I should do: is I should use IP6, you know, get my setup working exactly as I want, get really comfortable with FRR. I think because I heard that's highly recommended, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and then on then I'll have more justification to get on the waiting list for IP4. What region are you in? I'm in uh, 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 California, Dallas, New York. The, 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 the IPv4 waiting list has been completed and closed. So you're saying yeah, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Yeah, the likelihood I mean, that you're going to get some... v, v4 from Aaron is is next to nil unless somebody returns a big block for some reason. But my understanding is 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 they've swept that list and what they had left to give out they've given out, and Sands returned IPs would be the only way that space gets filled and nobody's going to return an IP to Aaron. They're too valuable on the open market. So you're path forward is either through purchasing v4 space or using um upstream v4 and doing ebgp and announcing somebody else's v4 so you can do that i mean if if hurricane electric gives you a chunk of v4 you can announce it in multiple places right you don't have okay. to have a you don't have to you don't have to have a run ip address space to announce it to other carriers you just have to have IP right. space assigned to you by somebody. So if you can get, if you can justify a slash 24 with someone, minimal announcement to slash 24, you can announce that through a different provider. Right. I could even sweeten the pot and make it, uh, you know, use the same provider in different cities. And then I could, they, they would, they they're would not, yeah, you could. You, that wouldn't that doesn't necessarily sweeten the pot because to them you're just that's just their IP space they're routing to you as a customer they'll do it over yeah. a BGP session they'll do it they'll, they'll give you BGP and um, but there's no benefit really to you to have two carrier connections 
to the same carrier. It doesn't give right. you much failure. Okay. In- All right. Well, that's an easier approach. I just I just sub sublease them from the carrier, and then I'm good to go. I've not used free range routing at all, but I'm using um, open BGPD and uh, OSPFD and whatever on open BSD for all my ISP routing stuff and uh, co-location for that matter. Okay. I, I use open BGPD as well. That's my preferred. Why would you use open, B- Why would you use open BGPD and FRR? Because FRR supports it, yeah? Who said I was running FRR on that host? <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I, I particularly like OpenBGPD. It's well done. What OS are you running it on? FreeBSD. Okay. Again, I suspect people will trickle in in about eight minutes. Uh, do we have other related topics? And by related, I, I very loosely mean packets or blocks travel through a computer <laughs> that is either a Lumos or a BSD. Any updates on uh, BI features? What are we getting in 14 and what are we getting in 13 too? I sure hope that 13 got the vCPU fix. I just need to sit down and verify that. Most of my machines don't have enough cores to make a meaningful test of that. But uh, that was one I was sure hoping for. And I it looks like we got that. Um, Corvin's work obviously just landed and won't be making it there. Uh, so specifically 13.2 or looking ahead to 14? Because it looks like the CTL iSCSI, Vert IO SCSI work, sorry, let me get that right, uh, will not be, be making it into any 13 branch because it's a significant change with the, the size of a tag. So for 14, that's fair game. And Jan has it working quite well. So hot pluggable storage using CTL and Verdeo SCSI will be within reach with 14. Um, that was, that took chasing down an, an issue that's documented in the minutes. Um, other big features, I'm probably missing the obvious here. Anyone jump in? <laughs> hot plug sounds awesome. Yes, you hand a machine a, a SCSI bus and uh, you do want to keep track of it, and there might be an opportunity for something like NetGraph Buzzy, uh, Buddy for like SCSI Buddy to just make sure you don't have one machine grab someone else's disk, but that can be mitigated. So Jan, who might trickle in in about six minutes, uh, has done some wonderful work with that. Um, Vitali was making some good progress with Save Restore, but... Um, uh, I haven't heard from him in a week or two. Hopefully he'll trickle in. Those are two pretty big, or three pretty big missing features. That'd be great. Yeah, so my motivation on vCPUs is that when you need to have a truly clean build environment that is like dramatically different, you can have you know, all minus one CPUs on the host handed over to a VM and all it does is is behave like as close to a bare metal different machine as possible. So there's that. Um, and did you say plan nine FS boot is possible already? Uh, that should be possible. And I have not revisited that on say Debian, which may pull it off, uh, you know, somehow QEMU and KVM have nearly every nifty feature working in some weird way such that uh, Daniel, you even helped me with the Deb bootstrap on FreeBSD to set up a Debian machine and, and get along there. It's not a super high performance nine P 
server and people generally turn to Ganesha, which is on and off supported, but it supposedly can do it. And I did have pretty good results with just a, a image booted VM that then added a 9P uh, connection. So let me put that on the list to revisit. Um, 9P. Did, did I hear that right? That there's a Deb boot, bootstrap expert in the room? Daniel definitely I mean, has some expert. experience, which was a lot more than what I had when I talked to him. So yes, he is the resident expert. I've, Go ahead. I've tried to okay, I've so tried to install about a thousand different types of uh, Linux appliances, and I've failed at eighty percent of them. But yeah, I'll tell you what I know. Okay, okay. The, the actually the question is, and I think Michael hit on the: Are you running Deb Bootstrap under FreeBSD to create a Debian tree, or are you? What are you doing with the bootstrap? See, so you can do Debian and you can do Devuan, D-V-U-A-N, which, which is Debian minus systemd. So that means that the RCs work. Um, but yeah, it works under FreeBSD. You can just do package install dev bootstrap 1B. Really? Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Okay, because um, but, that's but the, and, Proxmox. Proxmox is installed with with Debian Bootstrap. Oh, interesting. So, by by the way, also you can I just rsync minus x minus minus ax from a from a clean Debian install, and that that'll make a jail pretty well too. So I I created sometimes I'll create an appliance. With uh, with Beehive, and then R sync it into uh, you know R sync it you know into a whatever a, um, you know just a ZFS volume, and then boot it as a jail. And sometimes it works. Like I've I've definitely had some some appliances that pretty much come straight over uh, with the with the you know all the usual caveats of uh, the Linux. Um, yeah, the FreeBSD Linux support, like no no nginx unless you compile it right. Daniel, what were those rsync flags from a real machine? A real oh, uh, my lowercase x. Yeah, ax capital H. Yeah, whatever. Tax. <laughs> yeah, if you do that, that'll do. You know, so x is for one volume. H is for hard links. Uh, x is for uh, and A is for archive. So, okay, cool. and then you just do rsync slash right to your jail, and then it'll it'll boot. You know, um, you just have to use the service command instead of the systemd command, or use devlin, and then it has all the RCs you want. And Daniel, you found that on a FreeBSD host, you could then add a path to some FreeBSD utilities and saved yourself a whole lot of headache with that, that yeah i always add slash yeah i add slash rescue um and then you've got slash etsy slash rescue slash if config um so then that makes it really easy to set up the linux box with vnet um because you still have access to the free bsd init commands and i just i just pop all those into the exec start for the jail you know so if config lo0 up or, you know, and, and just make sure that we have local, uh, you know, a local interface and then, um, you know, all the IF config and route configs there. Uh, Rescue doesn't work great for DH for DHCP in the Linux jail, but now we're, you know, now, now we're getting extreme. You can get, you can get DHCP in a Linux jail, but it's, it's a little, it's a little trickier. Goodness, what's what's off the top of your head? What's the workaround? Uh, well, all the basics that you need for DHC. So you need BPF. So that means that your dev has to have BPF. So you're you're making a pretty permissive jail to begin with. But usually, what I do is I have FreeBSD uh, part of the FreeBSD base that you need in a CH root because DHCP has really specific needs for var and temp. And um, and Etsy, so that's why that's why DH client screws up. Um, 
So yeah, I put a I put a FreeBSD part partial FreeBSD base inside the Linux jail along with slash rescue. And then you can you can get it to happen. It's probably more work than it's more. <laughs> um probably find some other way to to pick IPs for it, but um, but yeah, if you need BPF anyway, that's that's definitely a possibility. Rodney, any other questions relating to that? Nope, I've gone off chasing Deb package, the package and some other things. I'm off in the weeds. Enjoy. Send a postcard. I don't think there's a lot of objection to the weeds. This it allows me in the attempt to dual boot Proxmox and FreeBSD from the same ZFS pool. It greatly short circuits the process of scripting that. It may be possible to completely script the, the setup of that under FreeBSD if I can run Deb Bootstrap on FreeBSD. Amen. I've been mucking with some mount points. Um, should be pretty easy. That is promising. We are on the hour. I, I say let's give another minute or two to possibly Jan and Corvin, but hey, maybe they're busy. But this has been a great conversation. Uh, hopefully, Brad, you have something to work with and Brian on NetGraph and the link save to NetGraph Buddy are in the notes there. And if VMB Hive has gotten that right, well, great, use it. Um, yeah, about uh, NetGraph Buddy. I don't know if that comes. I wouldn't necessarily. I would use that for, you know, I would I would use that specifically for how to how to do my own. Though I will say that it, it's in production on a couple dozen couple dozen servers that are specifically set up by me. So that's the amount of testing that that thing has received. Cool. Uh, welcome, Jan. There has been a time change such that we've been just discussing a number of topics for over 45 minutes. And you'll mostly- Yeah, I gotta, get, I gotta get out of here. Okay. Cool. See you later, so, super, take care, Daniel. You've been super helpful. Jan, do, go ahead and and check the notes. I've got a recording brewing such that if you feel you've missed anything, go for it. Uh, we've touched on topics like routing, we've touched on NetGraph, um, and Brad is new to the table here. Wait, this is never one of those, uh, let's uh, mix up the uh, time zones. Yeah. Uh, yes, and I believe I've added UTC times for those who can make sense of them in their head unlike me. Okay. So I'll, I'll add that in the announcement and just try to read the announcement. Yes, we will probably have the meeting like clockwork, although I will be in Tokyo next week, Thursday and it might be three in the morning such that um, I'll perhaps reach out to an alternative host or so. Anyhow, although yeah, John is technically the co-host. Any final thoughts? Any news to report, Jan? Uh, we did touch on, let's see, oh, CTL as a new feature, but that will not be making it into a 13 branch. But uh, Jan, are there any features landing in 13.2 that stand out for you? In I, I don't think so, um, except for that several people in this call promised to do regression testing uh, before the release uh, happens. The link should be in the minutes about mm. testing that VLAN tagging and link aggregation via LACP work. I know Jason Tubner was raising some yes. points about that. And he had That's a list a about point. things. And well, I think one of the Broadcom cards he tested needed the driver from ports to work correctly. And the one in base didn't work for this one chipset he tried. Please. Mm -hmm. Something else is uh, I've looked into um, in the PCR for gels mostly, and I've already encountered two bugs in the PCR, well, one and a half bugs, but they are not critical for what I think we will 
want to do with it. Is that using C jail or Lua jail? Neither. This would be the anything using lib uh, UCL with uh, the dot inherit macro. Hmm. A dot inherit macro as it is in lib UCL can only inherit from an object at the top level of the uh, configuration tree. You can't inherit, uh, put all the templates you want to inherit from into one sub-object and then inherit from multiple of these. But you don't have to because the parser is so fast and it's more flexible to include the same file multiple times. I think I know what I want to express is would require implementing your own macro, but it would be very nice to do that, where you would basically have a macro to load as, include a configuration file to process each direct, all config files in each directory. And the config files would be some links. It would be very nice and flexible and generic, and you could change how to interpret each directory and still get one view it all configured jails and the utility would, would then only uh, select which of this, these jails to work on. Uh, these uh, kind of things aren't really relevant to Beehive because uh, with Beehive, you don't address multiple uh, Beehive guests per uh, invocation of the Beehive uh, command. Um, at the risk of repeating yourself, could you kindly repeat yourself in about 20 seconds as Antronig joins in because he spent the week with LibUCL relating uh, I spent, to <laughs> Yeah, well, I spent uh, a lot of a week in London, so... <laughs> oh, uh, UCL, London, same thing. Yeah, um, so I didn't spend time on it. Hey, no worries, but, but just to communicate the issue, that's all I ask. Um, I have done yeah, my um, attempt. I've in already minutes, told but... him about it in the IS, uh, FreeBSD Jets uh, IRC channel. Oh, you have. Okay, so he's on top of. Okay, he's aware of it. I don't know if he knows about all, but uh... <laughs> no, I think I've come up with an answer. And of course, I'm always tempted to view it through the uh, Jets through the lens of service management and SX and how much nice other things could be when the current food is the init system. If uh, the whole discussion about service management and init systems wasn't uh, also much scorched uh, ground. Right. Uh, Antronik has joined. I guess, Antronik, the question to you, if you can hear me, is that has, has Jan adequately communicated over IRC the issue he found with relating to inheritance in UCL? Um, right, I I have not checked, uh, or have I? No, I did check the IRC messages. Uh, are we talking about the issue that free BSDs Lib UCL doesn't have inheritance? No, the thing is that I oh, I haven't uh, tried to use Lib UCL from base. I've only used lib, the latest Lib UCL as provided by ports for my experiments through uh, UCL CMD. Mm, okay. Uh, I haven't okay. checked if the uh, base uh, libucl is up to date, but I found the following problems. One is inheritance can only inherit from the top uh, level of the configuration tree structure uh, because it doesn't look into subnodes of the root node. So you can include a dot, the normal path separator on the config uh, tree in your key, but it will just search for a key containing dots or whatever separator you've configured before you uh, pass the configuration file. And there's a si simple, probably one line fix to replace this with the recursive lookup function that that would, as it is right now, it would break support for um, config files containing keys with dots because it would search and would split the path at the wrong path point. I think it would mm. make sense for a jail a command to use the slash as separator because that's already claimed in the file system namespace where jail the root directories have to live so that the dot which can be expected to be part of the jail name if you have a whole domain main including host name and domain 
Yeah. So how multi tenancy reasons or something. And in that case, you would use uh, uh, have to pass uh, the slash character uh, separator to libqcr before you pass it, which is I see. just not the default, but it's a one line invocation. Then. But to preserve exist this existing semantics, which aren't that smart at all, because if you define keys containing the path separator intentionally that's on you, so I would prefer to only do the non-recursive lookup, and if it doesn't find anything, retry the recursive lookup, so that as long as you don't use the separator in a key, at the top level, it, any separator containing name would just fail the first lookup and then hopefully uh, find your configuration in the second one and then inheritance would just work. And you could have all your templates in there. But the other thing is I found that I don't need to use inheritance because some links are very nice to use. Uh, for this, so the idea is that you have one jail.d directory containing the per jail configurations. And right now I have to have a per jail config file named jailname.ucl in this directory. And each of them contains the, uh, the uh, for example, the jail specific configuration and defines a subnode in Within, and contains the jail name as part of the one and only object there, which only includes files under the jail.d jailname.d directory. So that for each jail, you mm -hmm. would have a directory under the jail.d directory, and you would have a generic configuration file uh, to include the sub configuration into the jail. And I uh, oh. would want to come up with a macro to make it possible to basically configure use this generic including in config file for all jails so that you don't have to have a, any file inside the jail mention the jail and it would also handle registering the jail name as well mm -hmm. for expansion in the re-included files, which will then make a lot of sense to use include and this is not to mean that the, the um, include uh, the inherit bug shouldn't be fixed because it wasn't intentional it was just never tested by, uh, according to Alan Jude who requested this feature he just put all everything he wanted to inherit from in the uh, root object of the configuration Mm -hmm. The other bug I found is if you use include and derive the prefix from the file name, that the mm -hmm. uh, .conf or .ucl suffix in the file name is only stripped once per a uh, glob expansion because it basically tries, are you requesting a prefix and has the prefix not yet been extracted? And only then does it do the prefix extraction. And what's missing is that after it's done, with a file before it tries to make one, it would have to reset it. And it doesn't do that. I see. Uh, that's a proper bug. Uh, not just, uh, oh, I never thought about that because this really shouldn't happen that it only strips the .conf or .ucl suffix from the first uh, match containing the suffix or one of the two suffixes, which is why right now I have to include the name of the jail uh, inside the jail specific config but I think the best solution would be to write your own little macro so that you could basically say for every directory to uh, apply this config file which will then uh, contain includes including stuff from this directory through variable expansion and then you could have a any file to telling you how to assemble the jails, and you could just, and that one could have an include where you could put things in, where jail managers and something like this could just hook it in, and wouldn't have to change a single thing uh, in the base slash etc uh, jails directory if they don't want to, but they could still 
change all the defaults in non-trivial ways by putting it under USL local etc gels or something so that future base system upgrades can change the file but it would still include all the overrides on there and so you, um, it would be very forward compatible you would only put in the snippets you want to have okay well, apparently some of the things that you mentioned are a uh, UCL CMD bug, but the other ones no, are it's not actual UCL, UCL CMD specific. It's only okay. a bug in lib UCL, both of them. This isn't specific to lib uh, to the uh, UCL CMD front end. It would apply to oh, any see. application using lib UCL. I see both of them. I see. Okay. Um, one according to Alan Drew, because the both of her features is a proper bug. The other one is a well, I never thought this feature through to this level. <laughs> well, to, to not hijack the beehive code with libucl stuff, uh, I do recommend that we have an asynchronous location to discuss about this before we start integrating libucl um, with the jail subsystem. Yes, but uh, the way. I recommend, uh, I'm intent, I plan to do it. We wouldn't ha hit either of those bugs. I just encountered them mm. during my experiments by I doing see. quite unnatural things to libucl in my config files. And we thank you for it. And, and if you can, uh, to post the configuration at any gist. Uh, it would be good so we can try to reproduce and try to understand how we can solve them. Thank you, Jan, for that description. I will just uh, send you yeah, a you, ball you, of you, you, examples. You, you've done uh, detailed testing, apparently. <laughs> yep. I uh, tested it to uh, its limits and a bit beyond. Anything else while while we are all together? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, a few, perhaps, uh, if only myself, will be busy with Asia BSDCon next week, so I don't know what my participation will look like, but I might need help with moderation in my absence. Will Asia BSDCon um, be recorded? It should be. That is the plan. I, I do have a question. Of, of, it's very yes, not please. specifically beehive oriented, but more like so. I, I I'm I'm still one of the very few people who still runs a home server. Yay, uh, not on the cloud. And um, obviously, home servers evolve. So you know, at the beginning, you have everything on the you know single host, and then you start. Oh, jail. That's interesting. And then you become oh. Beehive, that's interesting. But at some point in time, you do have some things on the host machine. Usually, these things are a configuration, such as, uh, such as you know, Nginx if you have a reverse proxy, uh, maybe WireGuard if you're running a VPN, uh, RCConf, which is very common, and things like that. Um, is there a common practice on how do we back up a host machine? Because if I'm using ZFS, for my VMs and my jails, I can basically do, you know, so they send receive with things like, with things like ZREPL, uh, problem solved. But the host machine is very tricky. You know, you have home users, okay, let's say you copy also, you know, the user home machine, the user home data set. So the, the, this is where I'm kind of stuck. And at, at, at some level, I'm like, maybe I should not convert it to an actual hypervisor, but just, you know, or sync all the configuration that I'm interested in, or maybe I should actually convert it to a real hypervisor where the host machine is disposable. I should never care about it. Uh, the, who, who has any practice in that? We we have um, ZFS snapshots for everything and replicate them to an offline uh, backup server with lots of spinning disks. Um, in our data center, the host machines are disposable in the sense that we can recreate them because everything is ansible. There is no state or moving data on the hosts, but jails. And in my home lab, I run 
tunas in core and scale flavors and open sense. So again, if I have the configuration and if I have a replication of all the jails and all the VMs, then then I'm fine and I just need to reinstall, reimport the config and that's that. I would just generally I would advise to put every service in at least a jail if it's something that runs natively on FreeBSD and view hosts as jail platforms. And that's that. I never do anything that is of value and needs to be backed up and cannot be recreated automatically on a new piece of bare metal uh, on the host. And, and do you have any experience specifically with the with the reverse proxies? Because one of the problems that I'm, I think I'm going to have, I haven't tried it yet, is let's say I run Nginx on the host, which I am doing right now. But if I move the reverse proxy to a jail, there are two ways to do this. One of them is having another reverse proxy <laughs> at the front end, that is, or, or not a reverse proxy, sorry, uh, just a firewall on the firewall level, move everything on port 80 and, you know, 443 to that jail. But no, then all, if the jails need to communicate, yep, go on. Oh, the, the, the host does not run anything on port 443. We run everything in VNet jails and every jail has got its own IP address, at least IPv6. And okay. uh, the reverse proxy, in, in my case, in my home lab, the reverse proxy runs in a jail and the host just runs the TrueNAS UI. And, and that's that. Uh -huh. And in the data center, we have jails that are IPv6 exclusively. And for them, we run a reverse proxy, SNI proxy, to uh, provide IPv4 to IPv6 access for web applications. But this proxy, again, runs in a jail. There is simply nothing that runs on a host besides SSH. I see. I see. And, and your jails have real public IP addresses? Yes, of course. We are, we are a hosting also, provider. So. Yeah, I know. I know. That's, that's awesome. In, in the home in the home lab, the the open sense does the reverse proxy for uh, IPv4, and uh, oh. then and okay, it does a simple port forward for IPv4. So the reverse proxy that runs in the jail that does the real proxying for v4 yep. and v6. And, and that's where my brain got stuck is like you on, on the PF level, you're doing if a traffic comes to my external interface on mm -hmm. port 80, you move it to my uh, web jail, which it, you know what makes sense. But if a jail inside your system is trying to connect to that host, it doesn't uh it doesn't connect technically it doesn't connect your external interface especially it, it oh does. no no this might oh oh oh, oh it does oh I, I use hairpin net just sorry you use what ha hairpin net network address translation it's commonly called oh, hairpin because the yeah. internal the internal system reaches out to the public ip address goes through the open sense gets natted and then goes back in I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Then, then that does make sense. That does answer my question very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's that's interesting. Hairpin in that. Michael is asking. Is that accurate? How's that spelled? Yeah. Normally, it's written together. Uh, the problem yeah. with hairpin net is that it basically doubles your internal network traffic because even if both uh, server and client are on the same VLAN, the traffic goes to the router. Is not a back on the same interface and goes back to uh, your internal service. So if you have something like a 25 gig NFS server at home, uh, you may not want to torture your poor little router with it. Uh, for that, uh, split horizon DNS can be uh, the, the lesser. Yes, as in a DNS with multiple oh, views. With uh, right. split horizon uh, DNS, your DNS. Uh, service would basically look at the client address or you would configure your clients to use a different DNS resolver depending on the address and where they are. So basically internally your name resolves to uh, the internal IP address and so it bypasses the NAT router because it's just a direct end-to-end -end connection to inside your network. 
but this can also become a pain in the posterior to manage. Um, this applies to BI as well. One thing there where you can avoid a lot of the problems if you use IPv6 internally so that all of your jails have a flat unnetted address. Um, because as soon as you have IPv6, at least a global unicast with a static address, it's very easy to give every uh, jail its unique globally unique address, even if you put a firewall before that, and then have your DNS point to the reverse proxy, for which I prefer a HA proxy for anything TCP, uh, like even IMAP and SMTP. And uh, if the service supports it, which does apply to Postfix, XM, Dovecart, um, your normal web servers like and uh, Nginx and Apache, all of those support the HA proxy to, uh, proxy protocol, which is a, think of it like a layer four tunnel, where the TCP stream is prefixed with the layer three and four uh, connection information. So source and destination IP address and port numbers, making it possible if the application like Dovecard or Postfix is configured to trust the proxy, to uh, recover the original client address, for example, for DNS-based uh, uh, filtering to create uh, something like a spam blacklist via DNS on the client SMTP client address. Normally, if you put your mail server behind a um, TCP proxy, every incoming SMTP connection would look like it's coming from the proxy, but with the HA proxy protocol, you can uh, pass along the original connection uh, headers. Well, no, not the full header, just the port and address information, which is enough for uh, abuse uh, filtering. Oh, this uh, is a loop. Normally, like a three line that... configuration change to your services for supporting services, which includes everything where I care about preserving the source address. So, HTTP servers, yeah, HTTP that. servers, and for HTTP uh, and RTLS, you can filter by the HTTP v host uh, because it's a plain text protocol, and for HTTPS, you can filter by uh, SNI host name without even decrypting the stream. So your TLS reverse proxy would inspect the first. Uh, TLS record, which contains the SNI uh, host name in clear text, so that you can buffer the first few bytes. And if a client provides a valid uh, TLS hello packet with an SNI host name, you can route in your load balancer based on the host name provided in the SNI uh, part of the TLS hello packet, so that you can have multiple end-to-end -end encrypted TLS connections to the same public IPv4 address, and you would just proxy it to the IPv6 address. Because it's a full TCP proxy, you can proxy IPv4 incoming connections, preserving their client uh, IP address and port number via the proxy protocol to the um, the actual service, whether it's running inside Beehive or a jail, and performance is quite good. That way, so 10 gig is no problem. Doing it that way because HA proxy is so well optimized. It wouldn't be nice if FreeBSD gained full socket splicing support like Linux and OpenBSD, but even without that, it's at least up to 10 gigs if it's not really a problem. Above that, or for very small transfers, maybe, but um, especially because right now FreeBSD has a kernel TLS, so uh, the perfect goal right now would be to support socket splicing with KTLS so that you could even uh, de uh, decrypt and re encrypt uh, proxied connections without ever leaving the kernel.
so that you could splice two KTLS enabled sockets together. That would be uh, a true uh, killer feature for the FreeBSD network stack if someone brought that together because neither Linux nor OpenBSD support all of that. But with send and receive KTLS support, it could be done, probably not too much code. Uh, but yeah, that's not a famous last words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gen generally AJ proxy works great. We use it in various uh, installations and it's uh, part of, of OpenSense. There's a plugin, um, mm -hmm. so. I, I recommend just just using it. I can uh, grab my uh, HA proxy configuration because one of the things few people for some reason know is that you there is a basically a master and worker mode in HA proxy where you don't where you can do a zero downtime reconfigurations. You start a master process which never handles network traffic itself. And if you reload the configuration, uh, the worker sends its listening sockets to uh, the master for retrieval by the new uh, worker, which then takes over all the listening sockets to accept new connections. The old worker processes all connections up to a timeout to completion, so you can have true zero downtime reconfigurations. And the other thing is that you can use uh, tables to decouple the configuration so that you can have a, a lookup on the um, SMI or uh, V host name. Go, go through a table in um, HA proxy and then you have decoupled the front and back ends so that you don't have to ever. Um, read, modify, write a uh, single configuration file in your uh, configuration. Instead, you just put them in the right location or remove them, reload, and everything falls together without uh, having to have a file which lists all known backends. Or have to have a single front end configuration where each host name is listed and pointed at a backend. Instead, you have a mapping from the lowercase Hosting. But, but uh, I have to uh, get off in a few minutes at latest. Well, we've covered quite a few topics. Anything else? Mm. But, but such a Load balancing is very useful even with uh, virtual machines. Uh, this, the last part about networking does completely apply to uh, Beehive as well as uh, Giant. Naturally. Perfect connection there. Well, thank you all. See you next time, whatever call that might be on. Have a good one.